Welcome to the Non-Obvious Beyond Diversity Summit. I am so excited for another panel discussion about a topic that I think relates to all of us, health and fitness, and one that we mainly care deeply about, maybe even a little bit more deeply since we've been stuck at home through the pandemic. And I am joined by some amazing panelists, and I want to introduce them all to you right now. First, we have Maya Langlois who is a Canadian Olympic athlete uh, and will be talking to us about her experience being an athlete, a professional athlete. Um, so welcome, Maya. Nice to have you. Thank you very much. Excited to be here. You're welcome. Uh, we also have uh, Waylon Pahona Jr., uh, who is a uh, fitness trainer, a Native American, and works with uh, Native American youth and, uh, uh, and older people uh, to help them get fit and help to understand fitness. So welcome, Waylon. Nice to have you. Thanks. Looking forward to being here. Thank you. Um, also, we've got Reagan Chastain, who is a, a fitness athlete, a fatlete, as a, I, I mix up, I, like, I, it's hard to say, fatlete. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mix it up. But uh, you are an impressive person in many ways. You are a Guinness world record holder, and you've done many other things that we are going to talk about. So welcome, Reagan. Nice to have you. Oh, thanks. I'm super excited to be part of this. Thank you. And uh, finally, we've got Matt Nay, the founder of uh, One Kikana, which is a, a group that allows fitness trainers and for you to get a fitness trainer, find a fitness trainer, and is very forward thinking when it comes to uh, bringing in people with disabilities and helping people with disabilities to do specific types of workouts. So Ma Matt, welcome to the panel to you as well. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. You're welcome. And uh, what I'd like to do is just start with um, sort of a, a a level set around this topic, because there's so many different angles we could approach this with. And I thought, Maya, maybe we could turn to you first and just talk about your journey to becoming a professional athlete and some of the barriers that you faced uh, being um, Indian, Canadian, Canadian, Indian, I guess, um, would be the correct order of terms. <laughs> um, and, uh, and some of the barriers that you faced and overcame in order to become, first of all, a professional female basketball uh, player. And then secondly, to join the Olympic team and what that meant for you, uh, kind of through your progression. Yeah. I mean, it's a, that's a pretty big question. Uh, so, okay. So what it means to represent, uh, Canada, I'll, get that one first but um you know it's pretty cool to represent a country that also you know there's a lot of well many of us come from immigrant families and all that and like my family did so now to be able to you know represent a country that let my ancestors in is pretty honorable um there's definitely a lot of barriers just in terms of the the knowledge behind uh, sports and how to make it to, or even what it means to be an elite athlete, because that's, um, you know, that's taking care of your body, that's taking care of your mind. And then, you know, that's goal setting and all that. And, you know, my dad's from Guyana and, you know, that was, that's not really a big emphasis, you know, sports, it's mainly school and all that. So it was definitely navigating, uh, and learning the sports industry and how that works, uh, getting agents, having no um, female BIPOC coaches to relate to, other than my grade three teacher. And uh, <laughs> and let's uh, let's let's talk about and give you a, sh a shout out to your teacher for a moment, who I also happen to be married to. Um, who was teaching you back in elementary school. Yeah. Uh, and so we go way back uh, officially. And uh, and we were lucky enough to see you play in the Rio Olympics, um, which was a fantastic experience as well. So we had just a great, great time. Um, and I know that was really a big deal for you to be able to represent Canada and be there um, and be part of it. There's us there, not to go on the family holiday photo <laughs> memory lane thing, but you know, <laughs> just a little bit. It's okay. Just a little bit. Yeah. I think it's just, uh, you know, she was my only BIPOC um, woman coach and she's still such an influential woman to me. So imagine if there's multiple like leaders, you know, how much more of an effect it can have for a, a person like me in the younger generation that they can relate to. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. And it's, it, I mean, it really does. One of the things that we talk about when it comes to inclusiveness is you, you want to see someone who looks like you, 
Mm-hmm. And uh, Waylon, I want to bring you into this conversation because you're bringing uh, fitness to Native Americans who live both on a reservation, off of a reservation. You're in the community in Arizona, just doing amazing work. And, and part of it is inspired by uh, the, a really difficult path that you had to take to get to where you are now. So I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that path that got you to where you are now and then the work that you're doing right now. Okay. Um, so I grew up on the Hopi Reservation. Um, we are about 100 miles from the closest city. Um, we still, uh, and we choose to live this way, uh, we still don't have running water, um, um, electricity in certain villages. But growing up, I was uh, sexually abused from six to nine years old. Um, I've seen my father accidentally kill a three-year-old child. And I've also um, had to revive my mother when she tried to take her own life at 16. So what saved me was sports, um, football, baseball, and wrestling. I was, I was very involved in sports. But when I left, I, I, I gained a bunch of weight. Um, I gained over 100 pounds and was drinking, was doing a lot of bad stuff, fighting, uh, getting in trouble. And, um, yeah, there's some pictures of me there. And, um, you know, I uh, came to a point where I tried to take my own life in 2007. And from there, getting help, behavioral health, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. And from that point on, I finally met my, my, my demons. I finally met things that I've trauma in my life to make me want, become a personal trainer. So from that point on, I knew that it was my, a mindset. Sad to say that uh, a lot of indigenous people um, have been through the exact same things that I've been through in my life. And so how I've motivated and empowered people is my story and to let them know that you know right now um everything that has happened in my life has created me to be the person that i am today i'm very thankful of my life i love my life and that's basically how i've empowered people to to get healthy uh, i created a social media group that has over seventy thousand uh, indigenous people and it's promoting that lifestyle not just through physical activity but mindset you know because we're so broken as indigenous people uh, because of the trauma that we've experienced, because of the things that the federal government has done to us. Uh, I've went to different reservations. I've been to Canada. I've been all over the U.S. and Canada speaking my words of uh, empowerment. Um, So that's just a little bit about uh, what I've done. I just did uh, 26 marathons um, back to back for nine days. Uh, raising water for our indigenous our indigenous people, and I raised over ten thousand dollars. That was a month ago, and so I'm kind of still um, uh, recovering from my my feet blistering and everything. So uh, yeah, I do a lot of work um, uh, for for our indigenous people. That many marathons, and you're still standing and, and talking to us. I mean, that is <laughs> phenomenal. I can't, I can barely imagine even doing one. And and what a journey that you've that you've been on to do this and such important work and and to be that force in the community and to reach that many people. And you're reminding us really that that when we talk about health and, and fitness, it is more than just physical health and fitness. It's it's also mental health and, and fitness and, and to be able to overcome the challenges that, that you had with with PTSD and, and then to emerge on the other side and be able to help people in the way that you are is such an important story. And, and I, uh, I just love that. I want to get, we're going to get more into it. Um, so thank you. And can I add to that too? Um, of course. Also, also incorporating, uh, incorporating our indigenous lifestyle you know, how we were raised, you know, we ran um, for hundreds of years, you know, we've gathered food. So those are the mindsets that we're now implementing into people's thoughts and, and, and how we how we should live our lives. Yeah, so important. Reagan, you have a interesting journey because you don't look like a marathoner, but you in fact are a marathoner. So uh, talk to us a little bit about what it means to be a, a fat athlete, a fat athlete, and, uh, and how you got to this point in what you're doing. 
Sure. Well, I was always a bigger kid, uh, but I was also always a successful athlete. And then at some point I was told that those things couldn't go together, that I couldn't be healthy. I couldn't be an athlete unless I was thin. And my pursuit of thinness led me into a full-blown eating disorder that ruined my relationships for a long time with food and with movement in my body. And what healed that was uh, learning about health at every size and learning about focusing on my goals in terms of health and athletics rather than trying to manipulate my body size. And so I always want to be clear that health and fitness by any definition, they're not obligations, they're not barometer of, barometers of worthiness, they're not entirely within our control. And I've done both. So I can tell you for sure that uh, having a Netflix marathon and completing a marathon are morally equivalent activities. But I really believe that while nobody's obligated to participate in fitness, everybody should be welcome. And so that's been a lot of my journey is going and doing the fitnessy things I want to do, even if I don't meet someone's stereotypes. And so I'm a three-time national ballroom dance champion. I'm a two-time marathoner and I hold the Guinness World Record for heaviest woman to complete a marathon. Uh, and I, I got my first fitness certification in 1996 and was a fitness instructor in a higher weight body and still am. Uh, and so for my journey, it's been about realizing like there's a diversity of body sizes, just like there's diversity of anything else. And, you know, everyone of every size has a right to participate and feel completely welcome and be represented. You know, we talk about seeing yourself represented and often the only way I see myself represented in fitness spaces is as a before picture. And so I want people to be clear, like, I'm a during picture. This is what it is. And, you know, my body size may change bigger or smaller over my life, but that's not where my focus is. My focus is on my own goals for myself and my health and doing fitnessy things that I really enjoy. And, and again, seeing you and, and, uh, and seeing your story, I'm sure is a powerful force of inspiration for people who say, look, I don't want to be, like you said, just the before picture. I want to actually be uh, feel good about myself and feel healthy and, and do healthy things. It's not like uh, you're advocating that people just sit on their butt all the time. Obviously, you have not <laughs> done that. You've done you know way more than uh, than than a lot of people have who uh, who talk a lot about health and fitness, but don't actually do the things that, that you've done. And I love that. I love that. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, if people, nobody's obligated, right? I don't think I'm better than people who choose other hobbies that aren't fitness, but I do think it's really important. I get emails every single day from people who say, I always wanted to dance or I always wanted to try a 5k, but I never thought I could at my size until I saw you or somebody else doing it. My friend Jeanette DePatty and I started a Facebook community called Fit Fatties, which is for people of all sizes who want to talk about fitness from a weight neutral perspective. There's over 10,000 people in there now and they do almost every sport you can think of. It's such a diverse community of fat athletes out there. And so I just want people to know that if you want to try it, like, you know, you can, regardless of what people believe about you or your size or whether or not you belong. And it's so powerful to lean into it to not to to say, look, this isn't something that you have to be ashamed of or hide away or 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 not talk about. Like let's not only talk about it, but put it front and center and say, it's okay. You're okay that's such an important part of helping people to get motivated because I mean, I guess shame is a form of motivation, but it's certainly not as powerful as inspiration. Exactly. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that example. And, and Matt, uh, I want to talk about your example as well, because you're working in a, in another space in health and fitness that we haven't really talked about, which is uh, people with disabilities, which is a huge population. I mean, we've talked to many people with disabilities as part of the summit uh, one statistic that's often repeated, and I'm not even sure if it's exactly the right statistic, I'm sure you'll know, but 20% of people have some sort of disability. And, and so it's the biggest diversity group when you think about it, because it really cuts across all races, all genders. Uh, it's just people with, with some type of disability. And you're making fitness available for them uh, in a very powerful way. So tell us a little bit about how you're doing that. Yeah, so it's interesting. You listen to each person's reflections and, and what comes from their experiences. And I found that when I started diving into accessible and inclusive fitness research in Kakana, that there was very little out there that was representative of individuals with disabilities that was for, that was accessible first, that was welcoming. And so we went about trying to figure out a way to weave 
community and fitness together. And look, no different than the Pelotons of the world, except we're accessible first and our community, our members come in and they're working out to instructors with disabilities. They're working out to instructors without disabilities. They're working with other members with and without disabilities. And that provides a sense of safety. It allows them to feel welcomed. And then as everyone else in this panel can attest to, that's the outputs from, from the mental side of feeling a part of something kicks a, a kicks you into another gear, makes you a better enthusiast, fitness enthusiast, better athlete, uh, healthier and more and more well. Um, and it allows people to chart a course that is meant and is, is specifically for them first, as opposed to saying, here, just do what you can and we'll, we'll get to you when we get to you. Yeah, we when we talk to uh, several folks about disabilities and and thinking about what we can learn from people with disabilities, one of the fascinating things that that one of the leadership consultants I spoke to said is that uh, people with disabilities are are master collaborators because they know how to ask for help, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that a lot of us struggle with. And in the world of fitness, it strikes me that that perhaps they might be masters of fitness as well, because when you don't have the use of some body part, everything else has to become stronger in order to be able to uh, to do some of these things. And so uh, I imagine that that taking that and putting that into the world of fitness, like when you think about the way you position Kakana, do you lead with the disability? Is that like disability first or, or is it just sort of like, oh, by the way, some of our instructors have disabilities? You know, I, I lead with it's, it's together. It's, it's interwoven because I think the most important thing is that you're not telling individuals without disabilities you're going this way and individuals with disabilities you're going that way. And if you can show that these instructors with disabilities are ridiculously athletic or inspiring, engaging. And by the way, their classes are incredible. Whether you have a disability or you don't, you wanna take that class and you wanna be a part of that class or you wanna be a part of that community. And so, I mean, we make no bones, we're accessible first. And we wanna, we wanna make sure that when you come into the, to the community, we're gonna work to make it work for you. And if that is if that means we are focused on individual disabilities first yes but it also means that we're driving towards a a brand that memorializes inclusive inclusivity and you know creating a brand that's modern that's sleek that's in, that's empowering um that can rise above just oh it's it's a it's an accessible brand so it doesn't matter what you do or what you know I, we want this brand to be worldwide we want it to be uh driving messaging and making people take notice so that look maybe other people in the fitness industry in the fitness world have to adjust because they're not accessible yet so uh, i guess it's a little bit of both yeah, and, and each one of you, I think, has stories of how you have impacted individual people because, like, you're you're living this and you're interacting with with people, and I'm sure that's changed during the pandemic. And one of the things we're going to talk about is how it has changed. But Maya, maybe one of the things that that we could talk about with with you, just to bring the conversation into these divisions that sometimes happen is a lot of times we see in the world of health uh, and fitness, there is a difference between uh, like these categories of people. So like you've got like all the people who do this are over here, all the people who do that are over there. The Olympics is a great example of that. You've got the Olympics and then you've got the Paralympics and like they exist separately. Uh, if you were thinking about sort of those divisions and how we could perhaps break those down and you're, kind of playing in a sport where there's not a lot of people who look like you uh, who are playing. What have you seen that works to try and break some of those things down? And, and do you think about that when you're playing or do you just kind of think, look, I just want to be the best player I can be. And I look how I look, you know? 
Well, that's the thing. Um, you know, they well, basketball, okay, I think basketball is a great sport is because basketball is one of the few sports where a lot of different body types are accepted. So, you know, especially for women and, you know, especially playing in Russia, comparing the two cultures, um, Russians, they really, um, well, the professional league, they really like the aesthetics and they want a very slim people. And then you got, you know, Canadians and Americans, um, they were, we're, we come in all sizes, but we still excel in our sport. But I think um, as I'm getting older and as you get older and you play at an elite level, you get a lot of injuries. So I've incurred a lot of injuries. And my most recent one, recent one has really made me reflect on, um, well, like I had a nerve problem, so I wasn't able to run. So, you know, this is what I made my living. I was practicing two to four hours a day and now I am not practicing at all. So that really allowed me to reevaluate how I see sports, how I see exercise, and just simply, um, I think, especially elite athletes, we lose sight of what it means to exercise, and that's as simple as moving our bodies. And, you know, the moment I wasn't able to move my body the way I used to, my mental side got a little bit, no, my mental side got messed up. Um, you know, I just didn't look at myself the same. So through it, like this during COVID, it's been a really big self-reflection for me because, you know, I am a firm believer that, you know, exercise is supposed to be for the well-being as a whole, increase our physicality, sure, but also it's very important for the mental state. So I don't think it really, I think we really need to get rid of the stigma that, you know, if you play sports, it's about, you know, you need a certain body type or, um, you know, you got to fit a certain type of way. And, you know, I think as I'm coaching more players, especially at a tender age between 17 and 25 year olds, um, I'm really trying to emphasize, you know, it's connecting the body and the mind. And that's a complete fullness of health and well-being when you play sports. It's, it's huge. And, and it's, it's mindset and it's, it's mm -hmm. habits part of what you're you're talking about is building those habits and as a professional elite athlete like you're used to uh, maybe an infrastructure that that is uh, not always going to be there like coaches trainers like all of these people who are like look you got to show this is your job to show up and do this for four four hours a day as opposed to the rest of us who aren't in that space who say look we've got a job and now we've got to make time out of that job to go and work out uh on top of that for sure yeah even even now, as I enter, as I like to call the real world, as I'm making my transition um, away from, you know, being an athlete to the real world, it's just, um, it is a hard, harder thing to balance, but it's definitely something that I wouldn't lose sight of because I understand the impact it has on me mentally and the positive effects it has on my life overall. So, mm -hmm. um yeah, I, I, I totally, I totally empathize with that. I think I've seen, at least in my own life, not being a professional in this space, I definitely see the benefits of that. And, and Waylon, I know you mentioned that that working out and, and being fit and getting back into the world of fitness really saved you. And I want you to to tell us a little bit about like that moment when you did get back into it. And then just t talk us a little bit about some of the impact that you've had with the people that you're working with, because you're really doing this work on a, on a one-to-one -one basis. And I'm sure that's changed now during the pandemic. Uh, but you're, you're really interacting with people very directly. And so talk a little bit about that too. I think for me, just being an indigenous man, you know, where we're, um, certain cultures, traditions, we're taught to be warrior-like, you know, we don't cry, we don't share our emotions. And what I did was I became very transparent with everything that I was doing in my life, uh, expressing my, my sexual abuse, talking about those issues, uh, letting people know that it's okay to cry. It's okay to express yourself. You know, this is part of our wellness. This is, this is what's going to help us heal. And from there, just getting people to, to really embrace that. And I would get messages, you know, from people, thank you for sharing that. You know, I was sexually abused. You know, the intergenerational inter trauma systemic racism, you know, those things, um, people say, oh, that was a long time ago, but understand that those things put us in places far off. I mean, my own community, 
is over a hundred miles uh, away from the closest town. And so, uh, you know, those types of things have, have, we're still healing from those things and me sharing myself and expressing, you know, letting them know, you know, we can overcome this, we can be resilient, we can become healthier, you know, by, by meeting these emotions head on with what we've uh, dealt with and been through in our, li- in our lives, I think has, has really helped people find some hope in themselves to, to get outside, you know, to, to get over the things that they've been through in their lives you know, to understand it and, and, and cope with it, but, but move forward. Yeah. You're talking about really acknowledging these things that have happened in order to move forward. And one of the things that we've been doing at, uh, at many of the talks that are part of this non-obvious uh, summit is we've been doing a land acknowledgement. And essentially what that is uh, for people who haven't heard it or seen it at a live event and this is a little bit different because we're all at a virtual event. We're all physically in different places. Uh, but the idea is that we do this land acknowledgement to uh, recognize that we're all on lands that have been taken uh, from Native American populations. Uh, and depending on where we physically sit, it's been taken from a different tribe. And by acknowledging that, we want to acknowledge the history of that and the injustice of that uh, so that we do have a chance to try and be better. Uh, and try and move forward. And that is important for for land acknowledgement, I think, but but it's also just humanly important for us to recognize where we have come from in order to move forward. and and you being able to do that and being able to be vulnerable in the way that you are is is such a powerful example. Uh, I can imagine what people would uh, would say and the sort of feedback you you've had from doing that. Uh, and, and it's just a, a really great story. So thank you for for doing that and thank you for for sharing that. Thank you. Uh, Reagan, you mentioned that you've got a huge community of people who are really kind of following you, but also this movement that you've that you've created uh, around the work that you're doing. How important is it to have that sort of community from a motivation point of view to get you to actually follow through on those things that January 1st, you you know that you should do those resolutions that we make? Yeah, I mean, Fit Fatties isn't uh, about me. It's just something that I help to create. But I think community is so essential, and especially for athletes who are living with oppressions. And I, you know, obviously, as a white, cis, currently able bodied person living on stolen land, I benefit from a tremendous amount of oppression. Even as a fat athlete, there are people who live, you know, people of color who are also fat disabled people who are also fat. So, and that just, you know, amplifies the issues. So having a community where you can come, where you can talk about your frustrations, where you can get information, you know, hey, I'm trying these tri bikes and they don't work for me because, you know, I'm kicking myself in the stomach every time I pedal, like, has anybody faced that? And just really being able to get that information in a way that doesn't have any shame attached to it. Because fat people live in a world that wasn't created for us and then blames us for existing in it. And that's like a constant theme and it's a constant theme within sports as well. They're, you know, in triathlon, they don't make a kit that fits me. There's not one that exists. And so I kind of have to put it together. But like, so when you look at being able to participate in a sport, for us, sometimes getting dressed is a bigger challenge than anything else. And so having a community where you can really come, where you can be angry and frustrated and people will say, yeah, that's valid. This shouldn't be happening to you and you shouldn't have to work this hard, you know, just to do something that a lot of people do much more easily is incredibly important. And I think, you know, being part of Fit Fatties and then having my own platform and and communities is just such a huge uh, boost to me. And you just see people who, you know, they come to Fit Fatties and they start out, I'm, you know, I'm really wanting to work out, but I've, you know, haven't done it for a, li- a while. I'm worried about this and that and then getting that support and then being like, oh, I'm hitting my goals. I'm doing this thing is amazing. Like, it's so incredible to watch that. And that comes out of having a community of people who say, no, you're valid and worthy exactly as you are. And we're here. We want to see you chase your goals. Yeah, I mean, really fat fat shaming or or this idea of of making people feel bad for uh, for being overweight has been around for for a long time. I wonder if from your perspective, do you feel like it's changed over time? Like, is it getting better or is it the same as it was? What do you think? I think it's changing. I think it's 
incredibly ingrained and it's it gets ingrained with also like healthism and ableism in ways that help to entrench it and so there's this idea that the belief that everybody can become thin and that by doing so they become healthier and i don't believe the evidence supports that but even if it did telling people to hate the body they live in 100 percent of the time does not make people want to engage in caring for that body and so I think the first thing to say is you're you're valid and worthy and amazing at any size. That's the platform from which you can make the best decisions for yourself. And so I think anything within the fitness world that takes people away from that, that takes people away from seeing their body as amazing and as worthy of care and seeing themselves as valid and deserving a place and space in the world takes people in the wrong direction. Matt, you are in a industry that by most statistical reports, at least, and, and in the media, uh, has uh, exploded because of the pandemic. I mean, people working out remotely, working out at home, getting virtual training, uh, is is it was always a big business, but it's become an even bigger business now. I think you're uniquely positioned to talk to us a little bit about just what's changed in this world since the pandemic how has your your business changed how's the how's everything changed yeah uh it, you know it's it's a fascinating evolution when i when i started the idea for kakana i started going to nonprofits and just asking them questions and posing ideas about streaming fitness uh for individuals with disabilities specifically you know, the Pelotons of the world were already out. They've kind of blazed that path. Um, but 95% of the people I talked to that were inside nonprofits kept telling me that individuals with disabilities don't want to stream. They can't stream. It's too complicated. There's no connectivity. Uh, every possible excuse you could find. And then three, four, five months later, all of a sudden, everyone's streaming. Funny that all of a sudden it, it flips like that, but because of the pandemic, it has blazed a path that has provided more options and people can stop being stuck in their ways in terms of what they think individuals with disabilities can accomplish or can connect with uh, as opposed to, hey, let's create a product or let's do some virtual fitness to bridge the gap while this is happening. For us specifically, it was always going to be our DNA, uh, but this has really shown the, the world really at large, hey, just because someone has a disability doesn't mean they're incapable of streaming. Um, and so that was, that was an important point that I think was hammered home by COVID that a small startup was not able to hammer home on its own. One of the things that uh, that one of my good friends, Laura gassner Odding, says is uh, that one of the questions we should ask when moving forward and when moving into action, which is where I want to take the conversation now, is not what do you need, but what needs to happen. And I, I like that question in the context of fitness because what it says is if we're going to create a more inclusive world and make health and fitness, the world of health and fitness, more inclusive for everyone so that more people who look like all of you or who are are not seeing themselves reflected in some of the media and messages and things like that feel like this is for them and feel like they can jump in, what needs to happen in order for that to be the case? Maybe, Maya, you could talk about that first and just say, what's the shift that would need to happen for more young girls who who see themselves looking like you to say, yeah, I could be a professional athlete. I could I could do the things that you've done. I think it's, um, well, changing the perspective. So rather than having, you know, our measurements based upon our statistics or, you know, our measurements, it should be you know, based within, right? So it's always to be self-driven. It shouldn't be done for anyone else. And, you know, a lot of other people's motivators is based off of other people's dreams that they have for that one individual. So 
it's to practice nurturing yourself. It's to know, you know, um, it's to be thoughtful, caring and fulfilling your own personal needs, right? So if you need to rest and that person can run five more kilometers, okay, but you got to do what's best for you. So you're not overextending yourself physically, which, you know, connects to or consequently goes into the mental side. Um, so definitely the change is a, def a different mentality rather than, you know, no pain, no gain. It's, you know, practice nurturing yourself, uh, nurturing our minds, just like any other growing thing in, on this planet and universe. Love, love that. So good. Uh, Waylon, what about you? What, what, what are your tips, lessons, things that you've learned uh, when it comes to making what you do more available and, and more of an option for more people? I think right now, you know, especially during the pandemic, is just reinventing yourself. You know, um, we've been doing these things for hundreds of years of learning. I mean, um, you know, people are lucky to have a gym, could drive a couple miles to go to a gym where we, a lot of us don't have that accessibility. So really understanding, you know, how can we reinvent that? And, and we've been using Zoom a lot. Um, I've been teaching classes online, um, meeting men. I do an indigenous men's, uh, it's called the Strong Men's uh, Heart. And um, I meet with them every week and we talk about our emotions. We meet together and it's really cool because, you know, right now we can't mail bond. We can't watch uh, football games together. And so just to get this bromance to, to talk about our health and wellness and then also do an exercise after is, is what we've been going to, you know, the platform. And then also for indigenous people, understanding that nature is our gym, you know, going out, doing a virtual 5K, uh, going out, picking up some rocks. And we actually do this. Um, I know some um, uh, influencers now who, um, you know, lift heavy rocks or, or get logs together to exercise. And I think it's just doing that, reinventing your wellness. Yeah, it does. It makes it so accessible and, and really, uh, really effective. Really great. Reagan, how about you in terms of uh, tips, lessons, insights? I think it's three levels. I think it starts with representation. When you go into the fitness space, do you see yourselves represented in the leadership and the staff and the artwork in the magazines? Um, and then accessibility, you know, are there machines and props that work for you? And, and ending the idea that, oh, well, you'll be able to use it when you get thinner is some kind of inclusivity statement. Like inclusive means I can use it now. And then the third is training so that the people who are staff who are working, who are running fitness events are trained to be, you know, fat positive, body positive to help people see their bodies as valid and worthy rather than to make assumptions about goals. I, I can't tell you how many times I'm working out and somebody says, keep it up and you'll lose that weight. And I'm like, what weight? And that's an uncomfortable conversation that we get to have. But this idea that we can assume that based on how somebody looks, their fitness level or what they're trying to accomplish by being in a fitness space, that needs to end so that people can go and be involved in fitness on their own terms. Like I said, nobody's obligated to participate in fitness, but everybody should be and feel welcome. Yeah, that's uh, I can so imagine that conversation because especially because you're in L.A. So it's like <laughs> I can imagine people walking by. I just wish I could be a witness to that. I think it would just be so fun to watch you <laughs> just take people down a little bit who deserve to be taken down a little bit. I mean, it's a little way to educate in a way that keeps me in a you know good mental space while I'm trying to work out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Matt, uh, what about your experience with uh, with uh, one Kekana and, and just um, what you've uh, what you've seen? Yeah, I'd say be unapologetic um, and don't lower your standard and keep a high standard for what you want. Um, our goal from the beginning was could we create a a platform that just because it was an accessibly first platform, we weren't going to all, all of a sudden make the workouts uh, less energetic or less taxing or and the brand wasn't going to be just thrown together because it's, we were inclusive. You know, we are bold and brash and we want to be forward thinking and we want to motivate and we're not there's no apology for that and i don't think anyone out there should apologize for wanting to 
be fit or wanting to go out and work out and demand the types of workouts that they want to see. And I, I mean, I tell my members all the time, if you see something that you want, let us know and we'll go find it. Um, you know, and uh, it's too many times I just searching the internet or listening to conversations, uh, you know, doing research for Kakana, you, you'd find that videos were less strenuous or they didn't want to, they didn't want to make sure they hurt someone or they didn't, you know, they, they wanted to be extra careful and okay. They're all valid, but the standard has been low, lowered because of that. And, and for me, I think it's be okay to say, this is what I want. There's definitely a theme emerging in our conversation, I think. And I want to thank all of you for, for sharing your stories and sharing some of these insights, because it really is about, uh, about self-confidence, about saying like Matt, like what you said, saying what you want, being willing to be yourself, be vulnerable. Waylon, you talked about that. Uh, Maya being willing to put yourself first and really focus on that. And, and, and Reagan, like not stepping back, like, this is me, right? Like you, you stand in front of that and you say that um, to people. And, and I think that that in particular is the one thing, if there were one thing that could really make health and fitness more inclusive, if people felt willing to do that, and if they felt safe environments to be able to do that. So I just want to say thank you to all of you for taking some time, sharing your stories, sharing your really valuable expertise. I really, really appreciate it. I know people are going to love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, you've been watching this very special panel discussion on working out uh, and making the world of health and fitness more inclusive. This has been part of the Non-Obvious Beyond Diversity Summit. You can watch more videos like this by going to nonobviousdiversity.com, where our hashtag for the entire event is hashtag nonobviousdiversity. And I welcome you to check out more of that content and more amazing insights from the rest of our speakers. My name is Rohit Bhargava. I'm the host of the Non-Obvious Insights Show and this summit. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. And remember to always stay non-obvious.